Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, and welcome to the Cloud 2030 discussion on August 27th. This was a spirited, they all are, conversation about open source and how open source is going to impact the future or not impact the future, depending on your point of view. Uh, check it out. Of course, we put the discussion first, and then our hallway track uh, is at the end. So enjoy. If you want, please come in, join these conversations, be part of the community, uh, the2030.cloud. Uh, Christian, you you actually did some prep, right? You have some some slides for us. To uh, no, not really. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just put together uh, uh, four or five slides just to get uh, the discussion going, and then we can talk. And uh, don't judge me for the theme I'm using here because I was so bored with the usual <laughs> theme I use. I am sort of like a. Uh, you do whole kitty. This theme. <laughs> okay. Like so, it. yeah. Uh, so so uh, what I thought was I'll just run by a few slides and then we'll have an open discussion. That's what uh, I had in mind. And uh, yeah, I, I was expecting a few others to join to discuss something on serverless. They didn't join. Probably we can have a follow-up uh, track on that, a follow-up uh, session on that. So uh, this is uh, the talk about uh, open source becoming relevant is nothing new. Like uh, we had all that uh, discussion going on in 2010 with the uh, uh, cloud pundit saying that open source has no role in cloud and uh, Timo really saying that architecture matters and protocol matters, license doesn't matter. Then uh, Sam Ramji and Sam Johnston uh, even started uh, open cloud initiative to drive open formats and open protocol. Uh, they also argued that uh, open source doesn't matter. But what we have seen in the last 10 years uh, leading to cloud 2020 is open source so still matters and if the success of Kubernetes is any indication, open source is still alive and uh, it's uh, sort of like uh, uh, continuing to drive innovation. So uh, with cloud uh, 2030, when you go towards cloud 2030, I think uh, open source is still going to drive all the, uh, all the innovation around uh, cloud, but there are issues which we need to discuss. Uh, that could make open source uh, less relevant in the future. And uh, we need to confront those issues now. And I think that's where Lawrence might get uh, some interesting uh, talk, uh, uh, chat there. And uh, also, I think uh, we need to de define how open source is going to play a role in things like uh, edge computing, um, um, uh, serverless, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, a few other things. So I think uh, these are some of the topics we could talk uh, here in today's session as well as sometime in the future. So uh, that, that's my thinking. Like, uh, let's uh, have a open session, talk about uh, some of these topics. I think uh, uh, AI bias is a big, uh, big issue mm -hmm. now, though there are many contributors to it, including data uh, and all that. I think uh, some bias can be uh, removed uh, by em embracing open source. For example, the imp uh, implicit bias developers have, uh, all those things can be removed if the code is out in the open and more people, more eyeballs could uh, take a look at it. I think that we can reduce some of the bias out there. And similarly, like uh, we could uh, discuss the topics like, uh, what is the role of open source foundation? Because the Istio stuff <laughs> sort of brought into open uh, uh, some of the fault lines. So I think uh, yeah. we should discuss that and uh, we should sort of make sure that uh, the open source foundations or whatever uh, organization that's going to sort of uh, be, be there, uh, whatever forms, uh, form factors that are going to be there in terms of uh, supporting organizations for open source. I think we need to make sure that that is sustainable uh, and it puts code contribution at the center uh, of uh, getting any leverage. Right now, uh, open source foundations are like focused more on getting the money. Uh, if you throw $1 million, <laughs> you could take advantage of that and build a service and literally demolish many of the startups out there. So I think uh, that needs to change. Uh, we need to put code contribution as the currency for open source. We should go back to the roots, open source roots and uh, we should make sure that Richard Stallman uh, doesn't uh, uh, laugh out loud that, uh, thinking that whatever he said about uh, having flexible business-friendly open source is turning out to be true. We need to stop that and uh, uh, 
take it in a direction that makes open source more sustainable. So these are some of my thoughts. And uh, I think I see this as a continuing conversation. So ping me on Twitter. We can take a, a, have a session on any specific topic uh, in one of the future uh, weekly shows. So yeah, it, now I'm, uh, it's an open session from now on. So I have a question about this, Krish. Um, have mm -hmm. you thought through the why, like where open source kind of best fits in. And the reason I'm asking this question is to provide guidance that was squarely missing when we went through the Linux days and talked about open source of Linux versus Unix. And I've seen it kind of replaying itself again, where we get into these religious cesspools of discussion, um, which I don't think benefit anyone. I don't think it benefits those that are advocates of open source and I don't think it it benefits those that are advocates of commercial software. So I guess my, my question to you is, is really one of, do you have any guidance as to where open source really benefits and where it doesn't? Because you know, there's, there's kind of that yin and yang of maybe there are good places for it and maybe not. Um, but I was wondering if you have maybe some guidance that might help answer those questions or guide the conversation um, for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. In fact, uh, I've been thinking about it a lot. So the, 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 there are some discussions on uh, uh, where open source will fit in, in terms of like, a, hey, it's not going to make a difference in the case of infrastructure. So uh, we saw that discussion coming up in uh, OpenStack days. Of course, OpenStack didn't go, uh, really help, uh, help uh, in that discussion. But if you look at uh, Amazon oh. uh, AWS itself, do you think uh, Microsoft would have agreed to change the licensing terms to go from the software model to a services model? It wouldn't have happened. So, what, why didn't did open source this? help at all? Uh, in the case of uh, Amazon, I mean, why didn't OpenStack help it at all? Okay, uh, yeah, well, maybe because they were trying to go head on with Amazon rather than like trying to. Uh, be the next iteration of VMware virtualization. So that's where the, they made a mistake. And of course, uh, Rob and others have uh, uh, more thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I think open, OpenStack's challenges are almost a session of themselves for this. Um, yeah, I'm but, not sure I would use OpenStack as kind of the, the poster child of success or failure yeah. of open source specifically. Well, so but I was I've, asking a broader question of the value of open source specific and where it specifically would kind of fit in. And Larry, maybe that's where you were also kind of yeah. thinking into. Yeah, so uh, yeah, my, my, my thinking is open source fits in in cases where uh, the traditional proprietary licenses didn't give you flexibility to go behind, beyond what that company defines as the acceptable use. So, for, for example, the, that's why I quoted that uh, Amazon example. They could, they wouldn't, they couldn't have convinced uh, Microsoft to change the licensing terms so that they could offer it as a offer Windows as a service, you know, Windows virtual machines as a service. So clearly, like, uh, or if uh, Microsoft had seen that okay, there is value to as a service model, they would have jumped in long back. So uh, I think that license flexibility that allows people to go beyond normal acceptable uh, ways of using software i think that's where open source really comes into play uh, i don't believe in uh, open source uh, helping in terms of lock in all those all those things are okay you, you can put uh, uh, check marks over there but the real value lies in the flexibility of the license and uh, you could take it and uh, you could sort of innovate beyond uh, no, no, normal level, iterative uh, innovation. You could think completely out of, out of the box and probably build something uh, that that flexibility gives you that uh, opportunity to uh, build something that, that is only bounded by your imagination. I think that's where the value comes into picture. Maybe the, the, this is not something like uh, that, that can be quantified and probably given as a given out as a recipe for others to emulate. But I think uh, uh, the flexibility is where I see value for open source. Uh, of course, other things like uh, avoiding lock and all those things are check marks. Yeah. What are we talking about? Are we talking about specific projects, specific services in terms of open source? Uh, basically, where's the 
where's the point where where there's upstream collaboration between different cloud providers? Uh, in terms of, uh, I think collaboration between cloud providers, I would say, uh, I think any layer above infrastructure is where I am seeing collaboration. For example, at the infrastructure layer, I think uh, it was a total a total failure. We saw with the OpenStack, uh, CloudStack, and all that. Like uh, they, the cloud uh, cloud providers see it as a way, uh, uh, as a uh, as something that threatens them. So probably a layer above, like Kubernetes, Kubernetes, and maybe even K native, and uh, some of the OpenVSC, all those uh, areas above infrastructure is where cloud providers will be in, uh, interested. I don't think they are interested in. Uh, uh, doing anything open source. They use open source at the infrastructure layer, but at least I am I'm not seeing anything interesting at the layer of uh, infrastructure where they want to but, come together uh, and collaborate. I think, go, go ahead, my point of hold. No, uh, I think I was just going to make a point like uh, at least even in co uh, Kubernetes with introduction of like uh, cloud controller and trying to make it as uh, like the API for infrastructure, right? I think, uh, th uh, work has started in that direction but i know this is where rob uh, you you have i think we'll have a better perspective i just wanted to add that point to what chris was saying you know like uh, I, I know like uh, at least for the all the uh, major cloud provider that's not like that's their bread and butter they would not like to uh, uh, invest a lot there uh, again from a open source point of view uh, but then for us like uh, I come from, as Rob knows, I come from a telco background and we we, we dipped our toes with OpenStack and uh, how do I say now uh, with Edge and like distributed, uh, in, uh, the distributed nature of uh, infrastructures we'll, we'll have to build. Uh, th that is like one of the biggest questions uh, in any telco's mind right now, how we are going to do that. Uh, yeah, I just wanted I, to add I, that first. I, I, I absolutely agree with you on that. In fact, I was specifically responding to Lawrence's question on where cloud providers play a role, but I totally agree with you. The open source of the infrastructure layer, layer yes. is more useful as you go towards the edge and uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. areas outside of the cloud provider. Uh, what, once you get outside the big cloud providers, I think when you say, when, when, Krishna, when I, when, when, when I hear you say cloud providers, I hear you say top five, top 10. But there's this whole tier two and telco space where folks want to be cloud providers they, yes. and where they don't have the funds to build their own infrastructure. And that's where open source killed itself with complexity or, or sorry, open stack, right? Yeah. So open stack wasn't yeah. wanted to be this and the telcos really wanted it to be the solution, right? They tried. We got uh, still trying. Three, three or four Asian cloud <laughs> were built on yeah. open stack right now. Um, yeah. And, yeah, but, but then oh, telcos approach it with a very wrong mindset. Uh, like, yes, uh, I think uh, I, 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 being in there, the industry, being part of it and being part of the problem, I can admit it. Uh, like the way we approached it uh, was uh, uh, very wrong. The, that was like, okay, this is open source. But then we didn't uh, try to uh, change the way we have been thinking uh, around how we bring in software we still thought that you know we will do the same thing what we have been doing uh, with our infrastructure or with our applications you know bring in uh, evaluate the application bring a vendor with it and uh, they will uh, and an and, and 800 number with it and they will solve everything for you which uh, which definitely is that mindset changing in that industry or not really uh, oh, for sure. Uh, like uh, right now, if you look uh, who, who the leader is right now uh, with regards to the cloud native 5G uh, deployment, that's Rakuten. Uh, they uh, they basically are approaching it uh, with a very right mindset. Uh, they are trying to do the build their own, um, o o o like the whole OSS stack, they're trying to own it. And that is giving other uh, telcos some guidance. But as you know, like we, slow to move yeah like we we are not like other yeah so uh, I, but i see uh, positive changes like with openstack there was a huge lesson learned uh, uh, and uh, yeah yeah <laughs> Can you summarize that so, lesson so, into it? Into uh, into into I, I, I want. I want to hear the. I want to hear the the, the elevator last version of the lesson. Uh, uh, 
I don't know. Uh, I, I think uh, I think oh, that it was like it was for the spite of VMware's license. That's uh, like you know that the, mm. what they were asking for uh, for virtualization. That's why they said, okay, this is it. This this is where we'll go behind it. But then they thought, you know, like somebody else will can do it for them for cheaper. But then uh, people just uh, forgot to account for the opex. <laughs> That's like, what, what, yeah, I was, what, what I was thinking about the telcos, cause, and, I, and I talked to you and I talked to a whole bunch of yeah. people, you know, the telcos, and they were sort of like, well, we wanted, you know, two things. One is free software, because we're, we, don't, we, hate, we hate paying for boxes and, and an appliance that has expensive software but cheap hardware. And then um, we wanted, we wanted a, the ability to be vendor, vendor portable. Um, and OpenStack didn't. You know, accomplish those those missions specifically. Um, I, I actually the the point I was thinking of making is my experience with open source is it's sort of this David versus Goliath mm -hmm. idea where open source allows the 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 community the little people to you know bypass the big behemoths. And the thing that's weird to me about current current model to me and when I think about twenty thirty is open source has become this with foundations and giant companies, it's like, well, Amazon's the leader in open source. I'm like, wait a second, that's <laughs> counter to what open source yeah. is, it, where the power, where we're trying to put the power, If right? It's, mm -hmm. it's sort of like, mm -hmm. um, I'll go to a blockchain example, right? If 50% if of the blockchain participants are owned by China or one company, then it's not actually a blockchain, right? They, mm -hmm. It's not a community thing. But, um, Rob, I think I, there's. Yeah. Lawrence, go ahead. I'm oh, sorry. I just, I just think that the reason why I like foundations in this regard is because the cloud providers are the major source of the developers and the initiative mm. to work on things. No. So no. I, I will, will we disagree about that? But that's that's my thinking is if you get two out of the three main cloud providers to collaborate, plus have a, a big community, that's what you need. And then it doesn't matter if then everyone else has to join a board. That's the theory of the case. <laughs> no, but then so, uh, I, I'll get... Can I, can I sort of like uh, <laughs> yeah, sort of, uh, take you on that particular uh, point? I think- Chris, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. I had an example. I, I'll take Istio as an example where I think two big, two of the biggest cloud providers have been like, or, or like two or three big companies have been contributing it a lot. But then uh, uh, as an adopter, right, it, because they're like so much of technical debt, I cannot just bring it in, uh, like in my, uh, like, how do I say in my production environment like that, right? Uh, there is complexity there, like so many of technical know-hows there. Now I cannot do it that easily. I just, I was just going to make that point. It, it may be like that, uh, like that particular open source project can be easier for them to uh, get to their production environment, but not, not to like an uh, adopter. So. I was just going to try to make that point here. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, Lawrence, uh, to your I, question, like I, 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 yeah, Tim, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was just going to add in here. I mean, I guess the, the conversations are interesting. The, the part that I'm having a hard time with is, is kind of the why, you know, if I look at this from the customer perspective, tel accepting to moving telcos out of the, the mix for a minute, but just looking at kind of enterprise, I mean, there's a lot of question around, why should I be considering open source? And kind of going back to what you were saying, Krish, about licensing, if that's really the, the basis, and I can see some value there, um, that's one thing. But I, I'm just having a hard time following along as to where this fits in and why, and ensuring that it's not just an academic conversation around the theory of where open source fits in or just a vendor-centric perspective. Because otherwise, then you're just... You, you're having a lot of conversation and putting a lot of energy into it, but to what end, to what point, if you're not thinking about the customer and the value to the customer, which is that end to enterprise. I, I yeah, think perhaps yeah, Selena, really, on, unless on I'm missing something. Thing, you know, um, like I, I, I've worked now for, geez, over, over 15 years with startups. And uh, so, and, and I'm personally a, a, a a big use of open source, both professionally and, and, and privately. Uh, and at least my experience has been that the 
the value that open source provides versus enterprise product from a startup perspective is the, the low entry cost. Uh, a, a startup, particularly when, 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 you're, when you're acquiring users, you, you cannot spend $10,000 a month for a single product. Uh, that is not infrastructure uh, because that, that just breaks the bank. So, uh, and, and uh, particularly with, with enterprise products, uh, what, what, what I found is that there tends to be a gap in the, the pricing model between the, the open source or trial versions and then the next base level tier. I'll take, for example, um, Elasticsearch. I look at the XPAC license. Um, that that's a big gap between the, the what, what between the the features that are available uh, on on the base subscription versus the the next uh, pay tier, and uh, I think that is one of the things that drives towards adoption of open source uh, or or free slash open source. Uh, products and also towards the, the, the adoption of, uh, of cloud services where you're basically over a year your cost might be higher but the cost to test things out on the short term is much lower because you don't have that initial step of, of, of that you need to pay for. Yeah, but I think that works in the startup environment, but uh, for enterprises, that's uh, cost is not a problem, right? Like uh, they don't want to spend time or uh, human resources trying to figure things out. They want something that works out of the box. So I would love to hear some uh, enterprise uh, arguments too. Well, the other thing I was going to add there, Chris, is that it's if you're starting from the standpoint that, that open source is free, which a lot of folks do look at, I think that's a misnomer right from the start. I mean, it's the whole free like a puppy, right? You might get the puppy free, but you got to take care of it. And, you know, the value of open source comes from the contribution back into the community. And, and so, again, I go back to then what is the value? If, you're, if the value is because you see open source is a cheaper version than commercial software, I think that's a problem because it's missing a lot of components even beyond the cost component, right? And so that's, that's why, I, again, I fundamentally go back to what's the value then. I, I completely agree with you. Like the, the long-term cost of maintaining a product yourself is higher than, than buying something off the shelf, but the entry-level cost is lower. Uh, and then, a lot of times you end up sticking with inertia, like, all right, we already have this product, why switch? Uh, and this is something that, that, that we were talking in, in, in the track on, on Tuesday is that, uh, the charity, charity was saying that the, in, in order to switch from one product to another, there needs to be an order of magnitude difference in, in, in benefits. Order of magnitude difference, right? It has to be a much better thing to go to. I, yeah, I, the the struggle I have with this conversation is that, and the, is that it's really about sustaining. If you're building a product and you build it on open source, and you don't have a sustaining plan for that open source, then, you know, I, you're you're in deep trouble, right? If I'm an open, if I'm a startup, and I. I, I am, and I I, build, I choose open source technologies when I when I do that. We need to we're aware that that's something we're taking on as a sustaining model, or we pay to help sustain that that environment. Because if something goes goes away, then you're you're in trouble, right? Open source. You have the same problem with enterprises. Very enterprises. much the same problem with enterprises. And so, so I mean, I'd like yeah, keep going. So open source, this, the code's always there. If, if, a, if an enterprise company goes under, you might just lose that code forever. You might not be able to run it. There might be DRM, there might be who knows what. Something that's open source can be forked. Like look at uh, TrueCrypt is a great example where TrueCrypt even said it might be insecure, but yet enough people had enough momentum behind <laughs> it for people to keep pushing ahead with that code base. Um, even yeah, though- Yeah, uh, so, so that's a valid point uh, provided uh, 
you no. fork not just the code you fork the community too if you no, don't fork the community you have the code but you cannot do anything with it right so i'll tell you from experience it's actually not a valid point because it's a theoretical point and the reason why i say that is because the commercial products you have stability and then you make decisions based on that if you're working with a startup or working with a smaller company it's very common and i've done this many many times in the past you have to require code to be put in escrow as part of your contract with that particular company and so if anything happens to that company you at least have rights to the code and then you can choose to either develop it or move to a com this a is big solution. enterprise stuff you're talking about that's the world i live in is that's the enterprise we, I mean, we do I everything mean, startup you know <laughs> Well, I, that's also why we have these sure, even from the start. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just saying like, that, that's also why we have these, the, the the two tracks for the cloud twenty theory. And, and, and correct me if I'm I'm wrong, Rob, but the track today is is more geared towards the enterprise level discussion. It, to me, it's more about the future. And so the yeah, it's the, thing, the, the thing yeah. the thing that I would I would say is these these questions are ones that ha you know we need to get worked out i i don't you know i i think the enterprise who pays for the open source code is very real because what we're seeing is that open source is especially at the infrastructure layers is being funded by you know the infrastructure companies i'd, I'd love to have somebody correct me if i'm wrong but if what that means fundamentally is that if amazon microsoft and google and red hat ibm are you know doing the lion's share of these open source contributions for core infrastructure projects? Then they're going to do it in ways that benefit what their infrastructure is. But you, everyone just said that OpenStack was a failure. Is there a need for a new OpenStack to to, to basically to do it better? Yeah. I mean that's but, but uh, uh, part of part of what uh, happened with OpenStack is. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, no, no, no. I was about to say that in the infrastructure doesn't mean it has to be a open source version replacing amazon it it could uh, it could uh, be at a slightly different layer too the problem with the open stack is they were trying to uh, claim themselves to be the open source version of what you can do with amazon that's where they feel miserably eh? and uh, the fact that they didn't uh, even though at the time i supported them like uh, they didn't make their apis compatible with the uh, aws api i think uh, these are some of the reasons uh, why they fail, but uh, OpenStack failure, as Tim pointed out, OpenStack failure is, doesn't in any way make open source irrelevant in uh, in the space, I mean, in the infrastructure space. Yeah, you are muted. Uh, you are muted, uh, Lawrence. The reason why I bring it up is because the, and this has to do with the enterprise versus non enterprise. My, again, my theory is that. You need a significant enterprise adoption for any of these technologies to be viable long term. There's a few technologies that were driven not by enterprise, but that's the exception rather than the rule. So that's that's why I go back to enterprise use cases. Uh, so Docker is an example where it wasn't driven by enterprise, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, but I totally so agree with you. Okay. Right, but it was it was yeah. driven very much by and and this to me is I, one I, of the I interesting agree. things. I disagree. Docker was totally driven by enterprise. Okay, it was it was driven driven by a large company wanting to put a code base out there so that they could attract developers and get folks coming in who knew what that what Docker was all about. Um, but it, it it forked out of Google. Um, Docker didn't just appear <laughs> as a as a yeah. grassroots project. But actually, if you I've done I've no, the Docker the container was a gra grassroots project, right? Docker no. the container. No. The container format no. was a grass. No. We, we disagree. Yeah. Because it, I mean, yeah, when it, it was started. Is, it is an evolution. It is an evolution. I agree. What I'm saying is that uh, user interface, which they, which they may brought in and made it attractive for developers, that initially gained traction among uh, individual developers than enterprise developers. Uh, only later on, like uh, once it gained some momentum, then the enterprise developers started jumping in. So that, that's when like uh, Docker even started thinking about orchestration and uh, everything. Uh, that the, that's where Docker Docker started going down. Hmm. I, I have a I have a different view. Watching this evolve as an outsider analyst, that um, 
I, Paul, I, I agree with you. I just, I mean, listening to this reminds me of the double-edged sword conversation with open source. So I, I treat open source. Yeah, yeah. I agree too. Because I think most startups make the classic mistake of open sourcing their code and they, they, they leave it for, for folks like me to just take and make it into innovative stuff that makes money and they're left with nothing. And I, 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 I'm sorry about that, but that's, that's the mistake of open sourcing code to begin with. So that, that leaves you with really the Googles and the Red Hats of the world that put stuff out there. It's almost like a baited hook, right? In, in terms of how they, they cultivate these ecosystems, but all they're really doing is getting free development work and they're rolling it up into their commercial products. Maybe it's because I live in Raleigh and I'm next to Red Hat all day long and I listen to these guys and they're like, excuse my language, they're like effing pirates, okay? In the, in the software development world, I wouldn't touch any of their stuff and I wouldn't open source anything I do because I know how they rape and pillage. Yeah, that, that sort of brings up uh, another qu question like uh, which uh, Rob raised. Uh, how do you make open source sustainable? Uh, for, uh, you pointed topic. out to the Red Hat case and uh, the, then there is the foundation issue where, where yes. you could just throw in uh, $1 million and get rid of all the startups in the uh, ecosystem. So uh, how do we make it sustainable? That's, uh, that's another question. I think we have got uh, one question which Tim raised, which is what is the value for enterprise users? Then the next question we need to tackle is how do we make uh, yeah. open source sustainable? Any thoughts? I, I, and I would and just say that if you don't answer the first question, it's pretty hard to answer the second question. Yeah. yeah. Linux, yeah. Linux, Definitely, Linux. first question is critical. Yeah. Linux is the poster child, right? Because it didn't have the licensing model of Unix or Windows, right? And so it got used. And a large community, huge community evolved to make sure Linux was sustainable. But who benefited? Mostly Red Hat. Red Hat, as I, as I, said, Red, I think it's, and so Paul, I think I would agree. I would, this is what I would say about that. I think that, that Red Hat is, a, is an anomaly in the course of history. And we've been spending 20 years, people trying to have been replicating that model, thinking that if I just open source my stuff, I'll be Red Hat. I'll be the billion dollar open source company. And it's just not true. Right place, <laughs> right time, no, right now. Yeah. Well, actually, open, uh, one of the things that Red Hat did very successfully was they actually took a whole bunch of open source projects, bundled them in, and made them accessible. And they, they actually lived off this vision. Actually, of, it was more simplistic than that. So if you, go back right. to, if you go back to the Linux wars back in the 90s, when we were fighting with something other than BSD and Solaris, and we were looking for an alternative solution, you could go with the core Linux spin-offs, um, but the problem was you needed something in the middle. You needed one of the core Linux spin-offs, but you needed support because Linux wasn't as well known or understood in the enterprise. And so Red Hat started out really with basically providing support, commercial support mm -hmm. for a Linux product. And that's the core of where it started. Yep, but I agree 100%. But unfortunately, you know, there's a lot more to those Linux wars. I know I gloss over it, and those of you that remember those days understand the pain and, and a lot of the lessons that came from it. Unfortunately, most of the people that are working in open source today were never in the workplace during that time. And so a lot of those lessons have long been lost. And we're frankly revisiting them once again or having to go through it once again because those lessons were lost. But I think, again, fundamentally, you have to go back to the question of why, you know, right. what is the value? So if you, as, as, as a student of history in all of this, I, I agree with you um, that I, that's exactly what, that's exactly how the roots got started around Linux and Red Hat and, and what have you. And if you think about the potential for the, a, 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 an, a, an equivalent perfect storm, if you will, you know, between like, you know, Microsoft and Unix and then all, all this, and there's now there's an open source operating system out there. Um, you know, I, I think that, that the idea of cloud is not going to be it. I don't think there's going to be the kind of hegemony that was, that was in, in the operating system world that precipitated the need for Linux to exist and the, the pent up desire amongst um, developers and operators and users to support an open source operating system. I, I, don't, see, I don't see cloud as, as that um, perfect storm because I don't think that cloud is the panacea that quite frankly it was when we all got together in 2013 it's not it it's not it's maybe 
it's it's just not it. I, I think there's there's something else. There's a fourth generation of the internet in which this perfect storm could exist, in which case the, the desire to break down the oligopoly might be big enough to support an, uh, an open source movement equivalent to Linux. Right. And, and so th yeah, this, yeah. this was in the, in the chat, for those of the people who found the chat, I, I want to escalate, elevate this point because fundamentally when we're thinking about cloud 2030 and the future, the, the question I think he, in front of us is, is open source going to disrupt the current incumbents? Is it right? Oh. In what? And, and that's, I, think I think it's a wrong question to ask that we, I think yeah. uh, that, that's the mistake OpenStack did. Is it going to disrupt AWS? No, that's the wrong question to answer. I think the way we need to look at it is how open source is going to play an enabling role for future disruption. So if you look at open source as a way ah. to disrupt the incumbent, probably we are losing out. So we need to look at it as an enabler for future uh, disruptions. That's the way I see it. If you want the example of no. successful open source, but <laughs> Project. Sorry. I would Sorry. I would posit Sorry. that first of all, um, I would say absolutely. You, you know, it's not going to disrupt. I mean, you know, a lot of successful open source projects become services. Funnily enough, um, we've seen that plenty of times. But I think if you look at one that has succeeded, I would say it's Kubernetes actually, um, uh, and um, and it's why we base a lot of what we do on that. And it's not because it's open source; it's because it's actually ubiquitous or nearest at it. Um, and it's achieved something which OpenStack, CloudStack, none of those things ever got close to. Um, uh, it's useful and it's available. Um, uh, I think the other thing I'd add is that um, I do believe in foundations because they help with governance. So you don't have the single company open source project, which is actually a huge risk for an enterprise. So if you think about what Tim is saying, what's the value? Uh, of open source. Open source on its own has very little value to an enterprise, but open source that's properly governed, where there is one or more company that's providing a distribution, which means something that's consumable by enterprise, does have value. Um, the challenge, of course, is, as John was saying, I mean, you know, how do you, if you're, even if you're the original inventor of uh, an open source project, how do you monetize that? That's, that's really hard. Uh, and very few companies have succeeded. Even Docker arguably has failed in that. We're going to be talking yeah. about and, uh, and that's future. a very valid point. Yeah, go ahead, Tim. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, Duncan, I, I would say on Kubernetes specifically, I think you, I, I agree with your points, but then take it a step further. Why has Kubernetes been successful to this point? And will it be, will it be equally successful mm -hmm. into the future? I think it solved a problem, a specific problem that existed. Um, and it was a clever way to be able to solve it. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are open source projects that either are very niche or um, kind of one off. And so again, it goes back to the, what is the problem that it's trying to solve and what is the audience that that is solving it for? So, so I, I agree with that. It has to solve a real problem at the right time in history and space, but it has to be more than that. Um, I think that Kubernetes took off because it did that. It was novel and new, and it was replacing something failing in concept, which we can point to OpenStack as that poster child for that, that failure. So there was a, a ripe moment in history for a transition, but more importantly, a community formed and coalesced around it, and that allowed it to sort of be spread to the wind and become ubiquitous and more available and more people using it and more people contributing to it. And I think that that community aspect is the biggest part of what open source provides is people that can come together and coalesce around a technology that they can see and touch and be a community. Now, I'm not talking about any of the enterprise or the commercial aspects of things. Those are follow-ons or adjunct to that. But um, I think you have to have community around it because there are some amazing open source technology, stacks, services, platforms, solutions, applications, whatever you want to call them out there that never gained traction because they didn't gain community. Yeah, that sort of brings to the next, uh, the point which Duncan raised, uh, that is the relevance of foundations. Yes, I agree with uh, Duncan that you need a good foundation to ensure governance. So the question is, 
Do you want Apache kind of foundations that will ensure governance and maintain the community and focus only on that? Or do you need Linux foundation based uh, uh, trade associations mm -hmm. that uh, manages the trademarks, uh, does a lot of marketing and also the man, man, uh, handles governance? So what is the right approach to uh, sort of like drive the community so that open source is sustainable in long term? That yeah. is my question. My so the minutes, drawbacks I see with the yeah. Just so I, I think the Linux Foundation, Foundation has become or, no, go or ahead, projects under the Linux Foundation have become uh, more uh, fashionable, if you want to call it that, precisely because yeah. they allow marketing and and that yes exactly to invest. Yeah. So in my project. my problem is that <laughs> Duncan has firsthand experience on this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My problem with the Linux Foundation is I don't I am okay if they do marketing that's fine like that. Uh, but the problem is like they don't put uh, code contribution as the currency for leverage. That is my biggest problem. Like uh, for example, for example, let's take the case of Kubernetes. I mean, Amazon didn't contribute any uh, much code. Now I won't say any code. I didn't. They didn't um, contribute much code compared to other uh, other players in the community. But they leveraged it to the maximum, and they are making money, whereas no one else is making money. I don't care if Google or Red Hat doesn't make money, but I care about startups in the ecosystem. Who, are, who, are, who, who who would have had an opportunity to really make money if the behemoth like Amazon didn't come and uh, take away everything? That's my problem with the Linux Foundation and uh, but, but, other foundation grants that I'm doing. So, so, so arguably the counter to that is that it is very hard to make money out of Kubernetes because it is something where common cause is more important. And you know what would making money out of Kubernetes really mean? It's hard to see what that would mean. I mean, doing something yeah, else. Makes sense, but see, guys who are making money out of Kubernetes doesn't mean directly like uh, like Red Hat or uh, others like uh, making money directly. But the fact that um, uh, a startup couldn't gain lever any leverage inside the community uh, that hurts in making money outside of Kubernetes. Maybe using uh, Kubernetes at the core, but uh, innovating on top of it. But uh, once <laughs> uh, Behemoth comes and occupies the space, I think that's gone. But this, but this, this comes like back to is, is Sorry, has ahead. a huge amount of value, uh, um, and you know I'm very comfortable doing that, knowing that I can find Kubernetes pretty much everywhere. But the idea of you know being the next Heptio, the next whatever, it makes no sense. You know um, that 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 has passed and uh, yeah. long gone. But, but, it, but even and this was I you're, I guess you're you're I want to build on that point because I don't even the the next Heptio Heptio was you know effectively a, a VC in, investment you know, it was, a, it was a, a, an investment strategy it wasn't it, you know what 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 they did was they take and they did some good things but they, they really took rock stars they pulled them together and then they spun it out as an exit sure. the, yeah. the the idea that you know a startup with open source is going to disrupt something in market I think is and, and the key is with open source I to me, part of this discussion is we all expect the incumbents to be disrupted. The, the question in this, this no, you, we don't. Okay. Um, so, it, it, all right. <laughs> so maybe we need to say, could the, you know, what's, what, what's, what's the flyer here for the long odds? Because if the incumbents aren't disrupted, then 2030 is just 2020, uh, you know, with, with the temperature turned up to 11. Um, if, you know, to me, the interesting conversation becomes how, because how how does that direction change? Or maybe we all love it, and we're just like, hey, here's some features I'd like to see Amazon add. Um, but I don't, I don't have uh, this conversation. I'm not hearing that open source is going to deliver some breakthrough technology that is going to get mass adoption and and disrupt Amazon. Not in its current incarnation. It's not. Then that's then I think that the follow up conversation for this because I'm watching the clock is what would open source need to be in that follow up incarnation to actually create a new market rather than uh, opportunities I'll, give you, for I'll give you an example. I, I, I don't see open source disrupting the incumbent like Amazon, but if a, a player like Amazon was not in the market. Probably a startup could have taken something like Kubernetes and built a kind of abstraction that Fargate provides. Uh, maybe if Amazon was not there, 
maybe it would have offered an opportunity for a startup to provide that kind of an abstraction. That is missing today because uh, Behemoth's come and uh, they, if Amazon had contributed code and then they did this, I have no problem. You contribute I, code. Yeah, I, I, I that's, actually that's think my problem that is there. for somebody to disrupt what's going on today or create something new, there's got to be a profit motive and open source except through acquisition into big companies has not been showing the same type of, of build company opportunities. That, that's my purpose. But hold, hold on, because we actually need to wrap it. And there's plenty of conversation for additional, conver to, for, for this to have a follow-up. Uh, Tim, you and I, can we work out enough uh, so that we can talk uh, major themes for next, next week? Yep, there's an email Good. in your inbox. Awesome, you're awesome, thank you. So next week, we're gonna go back to topics, tracks, and themes, and we're gonna do some logistics, and we'll, I'm sure we'll have interesting arguments and fights about that, because that's the meat of what we're discussing anyway. Um, please, somebody, if you had trouble finding the Zoom link, I wanna put the registration and the Zoom links in an easier to find place. So send that to me one-on-one. -on -one. You can do it through Cloud2030 or however, Twitter, however you, you, you wanna do it. Please don't post the, the direct Zoom link because that's going to invite Zoom bombers in and, and that's problematic. But um, I do want to make it easier for, um, for <laughs> sorry, Tim, your, your career as a I'm Zoom bomber bomb. is assured. <laughs> it's assured. Tim, you're um, a one man bomb. So. Yeah, I, I, uh, this, is, this, is why, this is why green screen PJs are the next conference tchotchke for this. Um, you mean, Chris, you mean Chris wasn't Zoom bombing this whole time? Oh, <laughs> exactly. So please, please let me know. I want to make this easier to find. Uh, all right. Thanks, everybody. All right, everybody. Thank you. See you next week Thank or you. on Tuesday. Well, uh, we're week. talking IPv6 yeah. at DevOps. So it's going to be good. With, uh, What's Ed IPv6? It's this fantasy that people keep chasing <laughs> along with open source profits. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Okay, yeah, bye. Hello, Crush. Uh, hey, hey, Rob. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Doing good. So this is a casual discussion, right? Like, uh, okay. that's my expectation. Yeah, that we're yeah. we'll be. Uh, Sorry. Just talk. No worries. Yeah, did you have specific items that you wanted to uh, uh No, I just thought I will kickstart a discussion. Like I have a four or five slide deck just to oh, okay. kickstart the discussion. And uh, from there, I will, we will open it up and we'll have a, a more casual kind of discussion on various, various topics. Perfect. And then my, ex my expectation is that we use the first, usually 15 minutes as a hallway track. Okay, sure. Just to, so, just to talk, see how things are going. Um, absolutely, absolutely. It's been, working, it's been working actually really nicely for DevOps, the DevOps days. Mm -hmm. These, cause people come late anyway. And so what you do is you end up with a nice chance. People, the early birds get to get to talk a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, let's see. Hello, uh, everyone. Hi. Hey, Andrea. Hi. Hi, Krish. Hi, Paul. I don't know that I've ever seen you before, Krish. This is very yeah, fun. Yeah, I think this is the first time, I guess. Yes, usually we just chat on Twitter. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Twitter friends. Oh, I almost spit out my coffee on that one. Hey, Shane. That's uh, awesome. Good morning. And I don't even think I know Paul. He's not a Twitter friend yet. He's an Austin friend. You should, you definitely know. What? That. Oh my God. One what day we're not to socially get to distant. Yeah, it's like, uh, despite my shirt, this is actually a South by shirt. It's a cute shirt. <laughs> Hi, Lauren. I actually, I actually wore special, I special wear. Uh, you can, oh, you can probably it? see it. It's my, I uh, uh, figure out my camera. Open, it's my OpenStack. Uh, San Francisco, Santa, Santa Clara, Santa Clara. Santa Clara. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I like your old Dell crowbar T-shirts. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> we did. We had some really nice swag. Yeah, some of them I want to recreate. Ugh. We did. How is everyone? That's what we. That's what we're like. Somebody like uh, 
CTO advisor was sending out masks. He has he has masks as his conference. Oh, line. really? That's great. <laughs> I yeah. I was thinking PJs. PJ. And actually, I heard of somebody doing PJ bottoms. Oh my god, that's very funny. Yeah. We're not sending out swag yet. We're just sending out sample data. <laughs> sample data, you know, it's useful. It's. Trish, I had, I had are we going to talk about how? Uh, foundations are um, just for marketing, and that's all. <laughs> yeah, uh, that looks like it. Let's see. <laughs> we're, we're, we're no sacred cows. We're, 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 we're dead, everybody. Um, yeah, I, I'm. I, I expect we'll have. Hey, some, Lawrence, some good to meet you time. virtually. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. Um. Oh, I was. <sighs> Sorry, I was, and I'm pulling, I've pulled together a document um, for us to take notes in. I will put it in the chat. All right. And actually, I will put it in the cloud 23 if too many windows go open and my camera's blocking half of them. Um, so does I anyone do know what Chairman Powell said this morning? Whatever it was, it was really good, apparently. I haven't got that. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but apparently it was great. <laughs> Ex chairman pal, right? <laughs> oh, people coming in. Hold on a second. Who's I'm here? More. Welcome to the party. A lot of friends. So, Chris, where do you live? I, I live in Seattle. Oh, nice. Yeah. I actually understand downtown Seattle is pretty tricky right now. Yeah. 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 My parents were telling me that the riots were back in Minneapolis last night when I grew up. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. Good morning, friends. Hello. Hey, John. What's going on? John? Oh, I have a cloud. Hey, Mike. I didn't even see you sneak in. Hey there. How are you doing? Found oh my God. What's on your ear? Not my ear. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of history. I took a, took a mountain bike and fall and ripped my earlobe off of, uh, from the side of my head. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. Eh, I kept riding. Oh my God. Walter had his wisdom teeth out and while I was in the nurse's office getting picking him up, I was on the weekly call with Rob. The nurse loved me, thought I was so <laughs> compassionate. <laughs> I've got stories that go like that in capital raising. <laughs> oh, that's got to hurt. <laughs> just, that's just another Monday in raising capital for a startup. Earlobe. Huh. Exactly. <laughs> Give your left leg. Birth. <laughs> I know. I know. Okay, hey, so. you've, you've got two of them that's highly available earlobes. Hey. It's hard. It's, I'm having trouble. I'm hearing everybody in mono. <laughs> <laughs> Manny. Next time, do something cool like crash going downhill, not uphill. I know. That was, that was the, well, I was talking to my buddy that I was riding with, and I was like, yeah, I don't really remember the crash. And he goes, oh, I do. He goes, about half a mile earlier, I could tell you were getting tired, and I heard you put your foot down, and I heard you heard, heard something else, and then I heard clunk, 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 clunk. He goes, oh, yeah, it was time. <laughs> oh, that's brutal. Yeah, going too long when you're tired is. Yeah, it was great. Nice, nice early dawn ride before everyone else was up. Just wake up, you know, first people on the trail. It was great. Well, I mean, until the crash. It was great until, until the crash. crash. <laughs> One more cup of coffee, and I probably wouldn't have crashed. Oh, I'm going to mute for a second. How does everyone like Cloud 2030 thus far? I think it's fun. Okay. I mean, we need to make it more fun. Like that's why like today we are talking about uh, what Lawrence said. Okay, more I, fun. I'm liking it. I like the discussion. Okay, good. Yeah. 
I'm trying to think about fun. I'm we're fun. <laughs> After, after I mean the first the first one was amazing. Like I told Rob off offline, these are conversations that aren't happening yeah. in the industry right now that sort of need this face to face conversation mm-hmm. and back and forth. Mm-hmm. And there's you know in this group there's just so much respect among everybody to be able to to mix it up and mm-hmm. and actually Wait, have those conversations. Did, and did you say respect? <laughs> yeah, I, I, hold on, hold on a second. Hey, come on. I, I, still, I still, I still may be concussed. Accurate. I mean, you all may have respect, but nobody has respect for me. Come on. I still may be concussed from the fall. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Rob, we have a request for more fun. I more fun. I will try to deliver it. We can definitely. That's, and so the, the format I, and bring good topics. But um, goal here is 15 minutes of hallway track every, you know, as our, as our forming and then dot before we dive in. So yeah, please bring topics, bring rants. Um, I was, we, you know, bring news of the day and we can, we can, we can do it. We're doing the same thing on the DevOps sessions, by the way. Uh, and last, the DevOps session, we just did one with charity majors. Um, and she talked about observability for about 20 minutes and then she started ranting on management and fundraising and other stuff like that. And it was entertaining to say the least. She, she was a very insightful Fundraising person. can always make it interesting. Yeah, no, that was, she was, she was, she was good and talking about organizational accountability and things like that. So if you have tactical topics, um, please bring them to the Tuesday sessions or, or, we have a good stable base, just like I'm hoping we'll have here, um, which it looks like we do. And you know, so if you bring an idea or a topic and you want to just vet it through, that's there's always open agenda time like this. Now I'm talking logistics. Rob, okay, what? You, yeah. Where, hey, where's 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 the invite for the Tuesday sessions? It is in. So if you go into Cloud 2030, mm-hmm. um, there's a there's a topic thread. Hold on a second. I'll sh- I'll actually show you. Um, somewhere. And then I, I, I uh, got the domain. So now it's at uh, 2030.cloud. Let's see if I can do this in a fancy way. Hmm. That's, that's the, it, uh, it's, you can just do 20, the 2030.cloud as a, as a thing. Yeah. Let's see desktop, this one. Yeah, there we go. Um, and from here, Look at that. That's so cool. Um, if you go into the um, topics, there is a topic for um, DevOps, Lunch and Learn, and the invite is at the top of this. Sorry to drag you through the whole thing, but I'm trying to I'm trying to consolidate it down so we're putting things in, in consistent places. I think I have it on the home for 2032, but this is where like the recordings, I'm doing the same thing for the this these sessions. So the recordings are here, and then I'm getting fancier on the transcripts. So there's actually um, real, real like the the transcript I did for this one is time stamped and has speaker speaker names and fancy. I like I see. fancy, fancy. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, it's, yeah. I'm learning. It's not that. It's not a big lift to add real good transcripting. Are you using Rev.com or which one are you using? I'm using Otter. Cool. And I'm a. I'm, it's it's pretty it's pretty sweet. So for like for but for post I'll I'll reorder it. So like for this part of the conversation will show up at the end of the recording. So mm-hmm. people coming in after the fact they'll jump into our the right to the discussion, not to the hallway. <laughs> um and so all that stuff I have to pass back through the transcripts. Let's see if that's pretty cool. It's fun. All right, back to does that help on the, the sign ups? And please help, you know, promote this, promote this. It, the, since we're, we're not doing this corporate, the sponsorship's all gonna have to come through social media and people were doing referrals and, and stuff like that. So if you want somebody in the conversation, please invite them in. Um, I, I do not want this to become a sponsored event. Yeah. So we were, we were pretty clear on that one. <laughs> the reviews. <laughs> uh from that perspective so i don't have to run a check great 
You can. You just don't have to write it to the cloud twenty thirty. I'm I'm right here, ready. <laughs> Actually, I think Rob Mouse would would be would be happy to just say right. You, know, you can go direct to them. They'd be happy. Yeah. <laughs> Bypass me altogether. So, California people doing okay with the fires? It's like Tim. Tim was dealing with the door. I, I think Tim was in South, right? Like I, he was in San Diego or somewhere, right? Yeah. yeah. Then you're muted. James uh, James Urquhart was talking about uh, one of his vacation homes getting uh, pretty close to that zone. Sorry, folks. I had to step away for a minute. Um, yeah. No, I'm in Los Angeles, and uh, Los Angeles. Uh, the the air was actually pretty bad for the last week or so, but in the last couple of days, it's cleared out pretty well. Um, like I couldn't see across to downtown LA and the San Gabriel Mountains before. And as of yesterday, it was kind of the first time in a week and week and a half that I've been able to see them. Yeah, here in Silicon Valley, I'm in Mountain View. Um, we're 15 miles from three major groupings. Wow. of uh to the south to the north mm -hmm. and to the east <laughs> surrounded by them <laughs> in the last week and a half it was really bad um it was pretty much raining ash you wake up in the morning there'd be a layer of ash over everything uh yesterday though was beautiful it was 72 and blue skies and you couldn't smell the smoke um so i'm it, it's cleared out some it's a nice little break but the fires are still going so i imagine we'll be covered back in smoke here soon yeah. Oh man. Stay safe. 